Too many people know the Catholic faith too poorly. And as a result, they don't know how to detect these types of counterfeit spiritualities. New Age faux religiosity, which is all the rage in our secular culture, holds a disquietingly strong influence in the Christian world as well. In the first letter of St. John, the beloved apostle writes, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. In attempts to deepen their spiritual lives, many people fall into the trap of New Age superstition. Whether or not these people are actually trying to strengthen their interior life and get closer to God is not the point of this episode. Rather, this week's show will reveal how the New Age ideology is directly opposed to authentic Christianity. Later on, we'll have with us Father Mitch Pacwa, who's written and spoken extensively on this subject. But for now, here's our Mic'd Up report. In 1989, the Vatican warned Catholics of New Age practices, stating that Eastern prayer and meditation can be harmful to Catholic spirituality. The document was titled, Letter to the Bishops of the Catholic Church on Some Aspects of Christian Meditation. This document, put together by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, identified these non-Christian methods as erroneous forms or as a quick way of finding God. Fourteen years later, the Vatican again weighed in on the New Age. The 2003 document titled A Christian Reflection on the New Age was the result of a six-year study that amounted to a 90-page document. It was published by both the Pontifical Council for Culture and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Again, the Vatican warned of the dangers of New Age so-called prayer, bluntly informing Catholics that New Age practices are not really prayer. Rather, from the perspective of the New Age ideology, God's function is seen as supplying all our needs and shows the selfishness at the heart of this new age. The main difference between new age prayer and Christian prayer is self-centeredness versus God-centeredness. New age prayer focuses on the self as a kind of deity, some weird pantheistic silliness, and Christian prayer reaches out to a loving father, and Jesus taught us the greatest of all prayers, which begins, our father. A good acronym for prayer is ACTS. You can remember that, and that's the four elements of prayer, which the Mass perfectly embodies. And that's adoration, that's the A. Contrition, sorrow for your sins. Thanksgiving, you thank God for everything He's already done and everything we know He will do. And supplication, we ask Him for our needs. Prayer is relationship between a creature and His Creator. It's a relationship, and we know through Jesus, and in Jesus, and with Jesus, that it's a prayer between a father and his adopted child. And it's a relationship where he promises us everything and he will deliver, whereas the New Age prayer is an attempt to take everything without him, to sidestep him by making yourself your own God. Servant of God, Father John Hardin once said, at the root of the New Age movement is the denial of an infinite personal God who created the world. The church teaches that man's faculties make him capable of coming to a knowledge of the existence of a personal God, and God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, who alone is creator, calls man to seek him, to know him, and to love him with all his strength. This New Age denial of an infinite and personal God comes from its esoteric roots, that is, supposed knowledge that is restricted to a small group. Scholars equate the esoteric trend with occultism, a key factor in the development of the worldview from which the New Age emerged. Two of the most esoteric or New Age thinkers are Helena Blavatsky and Carl Jung. Blavatsky, who showed great favor towards Satanism, declared in a 1877 letter, I do not believe in a personal God, in a direct creator, or a supreme. Neither do I confess to a first cause, which implies the possibility of a last one. Carl Jung, on the other hand, was a Swiss psychologist and student of the infamous Sigmund Freud. Jung, right in line with the New Age creed, denied the existence of a creator, labeling God as a mere psychological function of man. I can say I am, little I am, because God can say I am who I am. So 
I share in his personhood by being created in his, his image and likeness. Now he's eternal, he's infinite, he's all powerful, he's omniscient. He has all these things. I have all these on a created small level. I'm not omniscient, I, I can know things. I'm not all powerful, I have some limited powers. But my personhood comes from him, so I share in his personhood. Your eternal destiny begins right now. Whether you fully realized it or not, it begins right now. That's why our Lord says, who believes in me has eternal life. Not will have eternal life, but has eternal life. It's already begun. So I'm already living for heaven or for hell right now. In its 2003 document, the Vatican stated that New Age has a marked preference for Eastern or pre-Christian religions. There is talk of God, but it is not a personal God. There is also talk of Christ, but this does not mean Jesus of Nazareth. The largest Eastern religion, Hinduism, is also the third largest world religion. Hinduism, typically identified in the Western world by terms like reincarnation or karma, claims no founder and actually rejects the description of religion. Unlike Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, for example, the doctrines for Hinduism are relative and fluid without regard for objective truth. So on the Feast of the Bicentennial, country's Bicentennial, July 4th, 1976, I had the opportunity in my freshman year in high school to serve Mass for Bishop Sheen, uh, who was the guest homilist at St. Mary's Cathedral uh, in San Francisco. After that, a uh, fellow came in, a kind of a hippie guy, into the sacristy where Bishop Sheen was talking to us, and he said, hey, Bishop Sheen, I've just written this new book combining the best of Eastern mysticism and Catholicism. And I watched with my own eyes. Sheen turned around, he was, he was talking to us as the altar was, he turned around and he yelled at the top of his lungs. He said, get out, get out. The Catholic faith is a gift from Almighty God. I will not have you polluting it. Get out. And he turned back around to us as though nothing had happened. Coming up is our church militant interview with Father Mitch Pacwa. Father Pacwa is a Jesuit priest, distinguished scholar, world-renowned speaker, and television host. Father Pacwa is most recognized for hosting EWTN's show, Scripture and Tradition. Pacwa also hosts EWTN's Open Line Wednesday. Throughout his priesthood, Father Pacwa has participated in many debates and has been one of the most vocal defenders of the Catholic faith in the 21st century. Among many other works, Father Pacwa is the author of Catholics in the New Age, which we'll be delving into with him right after this. We are honored to be here today with the distinguished Father Mitch Pacwa. Father Mitch, thank you so much for being here with, with us today. And on a personal note, you know, you have made a really big difference to me when I was still a revert in college, kind of coming back into the faith. My wife was an evangelical at the time and we were dating and, you know, things that you said, uh, content that you put out with EWTN really helped us uh, come into the faith together and to grow into the faith. So I'm personally indebted to you. And um, I got to be honest, I feel a little bit like Chris Farley on the Saturday Night Live skits when he's interviewing uh, Paul McCartney and like Bruce Willis, like awesome. So uh, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. All, of, all of whom I like. Right, right. <laughs> Classic skits. Um, so we're here to talk about, obviously, you put out a book on the new age. Um, yes. And that's a really meaningful topic today, and we're going to be jumping into that. But I, to take things from the top, um, you know, I'd like to ask you, what is the New Age? Because when I think of the New Age, as this is never my particular area of emphasis in theological studies or anything like that, you know, I kind of think of the moral relativist PTA mom who thinks gluten is the devil and does a lot of Pilates. But obviously that's a cartoonishly silly oversimplification. Yeah. What is the New Age? What's the basis of the New Age? Yeah. In many ways, 
the New Age movement has its seedbed in a number of sources, but one of the big ones was from Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. He was a Russian baroness who married a very elderly general when she was 16. So, of course, she inherited his wealth. And she spent much of her life, most of her life, traveling in Egypt, Tibet, India, to learn mysticism. And she had a strong belief that an ascend, the ascended masters of the great white brotherhood, a group of Aryan ascended spirits, would use certain individuals to take over the world and bring about a new age. And she was very influential. Uh, most people don't know her, but uh, Adolf Hitler belonged to one of the Blavatsky groups in Vienna from 1909 to 1914. Not that she was a Nazi, but he picked up on the Arianism and how she had said that the Aryans of, of Europe are now going to take the role that the Aryans of India should have had. So he was into that. Another uh, disciple who wrote a lot, but again, it's not so significant, was Alice Bailey. And Alice Bailey developed the idea of a new age coming. It didn't catch on until the 1970s. And people who were starting this movement looked to Alice Bailey as uh, for the term new age movement. I'll talk a little bit later about why they call it a new age age. Uh, it's definitely connected with the uh, age of Aquarius that was sung about in the movie uh, Hair, the play Hair. Uh, it was uh, part of their ideology because astrology also was brought in to their uh, approach to life. But the main beliefs of the New Age movement were a reaction against the dangers of the Cold War. With the world in such turmoil and with the you know, tw mid 20th century experiencing uh, World War II, the terrible slaughter of people in India and Pakistan, variety of religiously influenced uh, tensions between Palestinians and Israelis and other groups, they said, look, we have to find a way to become one. That was a major uh, motivation for the movement. To, how do we get people to become one? And they opted for a philosophy known as Monism. Monism teaches that everything is one reality, one thing, and that any diversity of perception is an illusion. They even borrowed a term from Hinduism called Maya, where all differences are an illusion, but oneness is the underlying reality. And they oftentimes like to use Einstein's famous theorem, uh, E equals MC squared, that energy equals uh, matter times the speed of light squared. Uh, and so therefore everything is light. So light is the one thing that, that exists. and. That they go for that. Um, one of the books I have here talks about their physics uh, and their and uh, so 
the Jesuit physicist said to me, reading this book as a physicist is like walking down a familiar street, but everything has been painted purple. <laughs> And in other words, it's a, it's a distortion and simplification uh, of this. I believe it was the Dancing Wu Li uh, uh, Masters that was the book. Well, at any rate, um, they believe that everything is one being. Now, when they are asked what is that one being, the standard New Age answer is that everything is God. This is another philosophical position. Pantheism. That, uh, it's called pantheism, correct. Pantheism. Everything is God. And that means the chair is God, the floor is God, the sky is God, the animals are God, but most importantly, I'm God. That is he. And for the New Age practitioner, the goal is to discover my own innate divinity. And so from that quest to experience the oneness and to realize in the sense of becoming a uh, God, I have to do various exercises to become aware of the divinity that already I am. Can I jump in there, Father? Because sure, you, go ahead. you write something really interesting in your book. And I was going to, as you were kind of queuing up this response, I was going to, I, I wanted to jump in there. And it's about Hinduism. And you have a, a segment in Catholics in the New Age on Hinduism particularly. And I was wondering, do they piggyback off of Hinduism, or is Hinduism really kind of something that was causally related to the New Age? Because, of course, many of these ideas are embedded in, in Hindu theology, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. You have to keep in mind that while the New Age believes in the oneness, they were actually fairly diverse. And at, for instance, the Beatles in the 1960s popularized a bit of Hinduism, especially transcendental meditation. And as the Beatles and other Hollywood people did that, lots of various Hindu-like groups uh, took advantage of it and made millions and millions of dollars. Uh, uh, some formed cults that had pretty strong control over their members. Others were in a business. Others were, you know, trying to promote Hinduism. And the New Age folks picked and chose among these things. It was not Hinduism. It's, there's no way I want to blame the poor Hindus for <laughs> this mishmash that they call the New Age movement. It was, uh, in general, I used to describe the New Age movement as the Mr. Potato Head approach to religion. You pick and choose different parts as you feel it. And they would also change the meaning of it. Um, we'll, we'll talk about reincarnation in a couple of minutes. But um, it was not what Hindus meant by reincarnation or they'll use the word karma a lot because they well, well we'll talk about that too in a second but there's no way that they meant the hindu concept of karma so there's this superficial uh, as some people called it uh back in those days california buddhism and california hinduism something nice something uh, light, uh, and by the way, it'd be Southern California, uh, <laughs> Northern parts of Northern uh, California have another kind of darkness to it, but you know, down in Southern California, it's light and fluffy. Um, that's, that's what was said about the type of Hinduism, Buddhism, or Zen 
that was used in the New Age movement, but it wasn't. Well, it the sounds hard disciplines. Just to interject, it sounds a lot like what you were saying with this physics and going back to E equals MC squared, where it's cloaked yeah. in the verbiage of something, yes. but it's just yes. a hodgepodge of word salad yes. meant to uh, kind of attach itself, to glom on to a greater idea and to give itself a kind of intellectual respectability that it wouldn't have if it was just like, I'm kind of a guy that, that smokes a lot of reefer and, um, you know, comes up with ideas while meditating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so this, the, the, the various techniques, whether they borrow from magic traditions and various kinds of witchcraft or from Hinduism or from Buddhism or whatever else they might have at hand, they all of these are meant to help you discover your innate divinity now another part of the attractiveness of the new age movement is that you make up whatever you want and if you believe that i'm god and you're god and everything is god then i can't be wrong i'm god and the same thing would be true about moral questions. This is where the New Age movement was at its most dangerous. That there is no such thing as evil. I am incapable of doing evil. I am God. And God is good, therefore I'm inherently good. That was their doctrine. And... Even the devil is good. In fact, a number of them would, again, using astrology, talked about the era of Christianity as the age of Pisces and that they are moving into the age of Aquarius, which is actually astronomically correct. Um, again, we'll talk about that later. But what they liked to point out about the age of Pisces is that Pisces is symbolized by what? The fish. There are two fish in the sign Pisces. And of course, we're familiar with the Greek word for fish being used as a symbol for Christ. But they would add that the second fish is his brother, Satan. It's very LDS. <laughs> Well, see that, you know, this all may come from similar roots. But, yeah, they believe that Satan was Jesus' brother. He's the obverse side of Jesus. But he's not bad either because he's God too. That's why, in you know, a lot of people think that Judas could not have gone to hell because you know, he's just another side of divinity. And so, at any rate, um, the, if you believe that everything is good and everything I do is good, then there is no judgment. That was a big, big issue in the movement when it came to morality. Don't judge any behavior as immoral because everybody's God. And... I remember one of the books, the guy had his own Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is, remember that I am God. Well, that means that me, not God speaking, I'm God. And thou shalt not commit adultery means don't adulterate your divinity. And if you are God, you can say, I'm married to this woman right now. And in a few hours, I can divorce her and marry my wife again. So you can justify having an affair because I'm God. I make, this is the, the kind of foolishness they came up with. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. That's, it's very satanical. It does kind of follow this pattern of trying to make yourself into a deity, into a self-deification. Self -deification. So earnestly you I know brought, it's it's a I little bit coherent bring up, sorry to interrupt but i would frequently bring up along that line genesis chapter three 
where that was, you know, Satan says, well, God knows that as soon as you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be as smart as God. You become gods. Well, it's really interesting yeah. how these little errors, even what seems like a small error uh, in theology, in philosophy, can spawn fruit that's so treacherous, treacherous and sinister. Um, I guess that's what ideas have consequences and people don't understand that when they get off the, the straight and narrow of Christianity, they tend to take left turns that leads them in the polar opposite direction, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Well, now, when this, in regard to this moral stance, this explains the New Age version of karma and reincarnation. They all believe that this life is too short to fully realize your own divinity. So you need to become reincarnated many times. Now, again, nothing you do is evil in the New Age doctrine. It's all a different lesson. So, for instance, if I want to commit a rape, that's not evil. It's just a lesson and a difficult lesson. But later on in my next life, I will be raped, not as a punishment. They didn't believe that that would, you can't punish because there's no such thing as evil. Instead, if I rape during one lifetime, I'll be raped in another one, so that I learn the lesson of both sides of that coin. If I murder in this life, I will later be murdered. So I learn both sides of the coin. And this was their typical attitude. Now in Hinduism, that is not the meaning of karma. Karma is an impersonal principle that if uh, every action has its negative reaction and that you are punished for doing bad things and you suffer uh, in the next life because you did evil in the present life. Or, and you ask, and, you write about that in your book, you know, in yeah. your treatment of this bastardization, if I could say, of, of karma, of Hindu principles, you mm -hmm. talk about how there's no hierarchy for the New Age movement, and there very much was a hierarchy of, of creatures uh, yes. in, for, for practitioners of the Hindu religion. So there's a little bit of a, again, it's more back to the EM equals MC squared analogy. Yeah, right, right. It's, it's uh, again, Mr. P or Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> yeah. You know, picking and choosing, uh, mixing and matching, and coming up with this mishmash. Um, this was very important, and I think this was its most de uh, uh, demonic component. Uh, Alice Bailey, who invented the term New Age, wrote in 1949 that the Jews deserved what happened to them in Hitler's concentration camps because they had bad karma. But they, in the age of Aquarius, they will be reincarnated with a new consciousness. Uh, and all of the monotheists, all those who believe in the one God, um, as distinct from creation, uh, will have to go through the same thing. We may have, and she wrote, we may have to kill a lot of the monotheists, the Christians, Muslims, and Jews, uh, because there are too many of them, and then they'll all come back reincarnated with the age of Aquarius mentality. That was her writing. Despicable. So th this is something, again, few New Agers bought into that but it's lurking in the background, and a few of them did. Father, now, Father can I ask you, because the, the way you've structured your book, you know, mm -hmm. you spent a lot of time on Carl Jung and yes. his psychology and kind of worldview. Um, yes. And why did you choose to spend so much time on him? Why is he important? What is the intersection between him and the New Age movement? 
if you don't mind, before I answer that, let me just deal with one last element, the, namely this idea of the age of Aquarius, because Jung believed in the age of Aquarius. He practiced astrology himself. So let me do that in terms of the new age, and then I'll go into why I, I had so much time on Carl Jung. In the new age worldview, they believed that we're, that we're the, coming into the age of Aquarius. What is that? Can, can you see this pen? I can. I don't. I don't have a globe here. I used to take a, a globe with me. But as everybody knows, when you see a globe, it's at an angle, correct? Yes. I used, it used to be frustrating to me. I said, "What? Look, it's floating in space. Why not have a straight up and down?" You know, it seemed more symmetrical to me. But in fact, the Earth is at approximately a 23 degree angle in relationship to the plane of the elliptical orbit around the sun. That's why it's always at an angle, okay? Now, why is that? Because the Earth is spinning on its axis, so I can spin my pen around, you can see that. And in addition to spinning on the axis and going around the sun, the Earth is also experiencing a precession of the axis. You've played with tops before as a kid? Definitely. Okay. As an adult, too, to be honest. Okay. Uh, maybe I should go back. I'm a father of six, no, I, so I'm playing with toys all the time, father. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, no, I mean, I should maybe go back to playing with a top again. But at any rate, <laughs> a top isn't straight up. So is at an angle as it spins, spins on its axis, and the top makes a circular motion, right? Until it loses energy and then collapses. The Earth is like a top. It spins on the axis, but the axis is making a rotation. And that rotation takes 26,000 years to complete. So only the nuns might see the whole thing, but <laughs> the rest of us don't live that long. And so it's about a 2,120 year period for each sidereal age. You see the signs of the zodiac, they see in the newspaper, they are the horizon that you can see with the naked eye as the Earth makes its orbit around the sun. And for 2,100 years or so, the axis points at one of those signs. So for the last couple thousand years, it pointed at the sign Pisces. Before that, it pointed at Taurus. That's why the Mithra worship at the time of Christ was it had a bull symbol because they were going through a crisis as they moved from the bull towards the uh, Pisces. And now it's moving out of Pisces into the sign Aquarius. That's what they mean by the dawning of the age of Aquarius. They also see this as the end of Christianity. Christianity was in the time of Pisces. It's inevitably going to die out and the age of Aquarius will begin, and everybody will be a new ager. This is their kind of apocalypticism. Apocalypticism. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, old, the myth of Atlantis means that it will rise out of the sea. Um, back in the 60s, the pop singer Donovan sang a song about Atlantis rising out of the sea and all these kind of things. And they, some of them believe the Earth will shift its axis and all this stuff. But this is part of their mythology. But it lends itself to their belief in the absolute inevitability of the new age. 
And so they're just ahead of the curve and leading other people. That's how they see themselves. So those are the key elements. Monist, that everything is one being. Secondly, everything is God. You have to learn to realize you're God. And if you don't do it in this life, you'll come back. There is no such thing as evil. We're all good. So everything we do is good. And there's this coming age, this apocalyptic period of uh, the age of Aquarius. Those are their main doctrines. Now, I spent a lot of time on Carl Jung for this reason. In the early 70s and later, the philosophy of Carl Jung started to become popular in Catholic circles. One reason was Freudianism was in a thorough collapse after the 1950s. Freudianism was absolutely solid. That was thought to be the psychology of all time, but it didn't help people get better. So it got dropped, you know. Um, and then in the 60s, existentialist uh, psychology, Carl Rogers, uh, Abraham Maslow, Eric Erickson, Eric Fromm, these psychologists came into prominence. But there's something missing, a religious element missing. Carl Jung believed in religion very much. Freud hated religion, and that's what split Jung from Freud. They used to be close associates. They split. And it was over religion. But Jung believed in any and every religion. So he would use astrology. He would use the I Ching, a Chinese fortune-telling uh, device that, to help predict the, uh, something about your personality and tell you about your personality. He would um, study the mythologies of Egypt and India, like Madame Blavatsky. But he would also, like Madame Blavatsky, he would change them to fit his ideas of psychology. And he also studied a number of Catholic elements. Partly, he, he was the son of a Swiss reform minister, you know, a Zwinglian uh, minister, not Calvinist, but a follower of Zwingli. Um, he lost faith in that, but he was fascinated with Catholicism. And he even wrote once that fewer than 2% of my patients are practicing Catholics. If they go to confession, they don't need me. Huh. I think that's true. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the other folks did. And he would incorporate this spiritual element. Well, a lot of Catholics began studying Jung because he was open to spiritual life and spirituality. And this was a psychologist that seems would have some spiritual dimension after the first hundred years or so of psychology rejecting religion and spirituality. And people became fascinated, but they didn't know what Jung actually taught. And so I did the work I did. I, I, I was one of them. I was reading a lot of Jung. Uh, but you know, as I saw him, uh, his writings, like his answer to Job, in which he says, uh, and there are a couple of books where he said this, that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the fourth person of the Trinity. That was the meaning of the uh, dogma of the Assumption, that it made her the fourth person of the Trinity. No, it didn't. And then in another book, uh, uh, another part of, in the beginning of the answer to Job, when he reflected on Job chapters 1 and 2, he said that Satan was the fourth person of the Trinity. So either Satan is Mary, or you don't have a quaternity, but a quintinity instead of a trinity. <laughs> you have five persons in the Godhead. Um, this is, uh, you know, you can see where it's 
theological nonsense but i would i over the years i was hearing people protestants and catholics alike say to me well uh, why did you catholics make mary the fourth person of the trinity uh we didn't i've actually heard that i've heard that from my family members before yeah that's where it comes from is jung I was always wondering that. I check that off the bucket list of questions to be answered. Where does that that preposterous idea yeah. come from? So we have Jung to thank for that. At, you can find it at the end of his book, Answer to Job. That's where you, you, you see that. And there, there's another place, um, I think, in volume nine of his collected works that also speaks of it. Very good. So... So that's why I spent time with Jung, uh, and it w- it's interesting, uh, a priest I know who had studied Carl Jung's uh, psychological reflections on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, uh, did a dissertation on that, in a, in a time. and he was very fascinated with Jung. Um, when he became one of the readers of the manuscripts so I could, you know, get it published, you know, uh, you know, with permission from my superiors. And he did the same thing that other people did in other parts of the book. Um, you've exposed Jung for what he is. You know, I didn't see a lot of this stuff. He was so focused on one aspect of Jung, he filtered out the spiritism and all these other things that were theologically uh, and, and spiritually in great error. And he kind of left off a good deal of what he had been pushing before. Sure. Well, you know, we're, we're getting up against the clock a little bit, but I did want to make sure that I asked you about the Enneagram. And I was kind of chuckling yeah. to myself because I, I knew, you know, as substantial a portion of this book um, as it is, you say in the book, actually, that... Um, The Enneagram is too complex to explain repeatedly to people, and that's a quote. So I was like, dang it, I have to ask him about that. Could you explain the Enneagram to us, Father? Sure, sure. The Enneagram simply is a circle with nine points within it. The three, six, and nine are connected with lines inside, making a uh, triangle. The other numbers are connected with a geometric figure with lines inside the circle. And the line goes from 1 to 4 to 2 to 8 to 5 to 7 and back to 1 again. Why? Because it depends on the decimal point. The number of dividing seven into one, okay? So you take, seven is a sacred number in a lot of circles. So you divide seven into one, you get point one four, uh, one four two eight five seven, repeated ad infinitum. And you divide one, uh, three into one, and it's three, six, nine. You know, so the, the, they're playing with that, those decimal uh, uh, points and ge- geometry. Originally, the, the Enneagram was a figure used in Central Asia for fortune telling. Then later on, at least by the 19th century, late 19th century, we don't know if earlier, but by the late 19th century, some uh, Sufi groups, the Naqshbandi band of Saramuni Sufis, used the Enneagram as a symbol of becoming one with God and becoming God. So it was a symbol of the stages toward realization of being God. Then, around 1968 A.D., uh, a Chilean man named Oscar Ichazo, uh, was channeling a spirit. I believe it was Metatron. That's 
what I think it was. And this spirit told him to put names on each one of those nine points around that circle. And he met up with a psychologist from the Esalen Institute in California who took the personality types described by the American psychologist, Karen Horney, and he applied those to each one of those numbers. And together they developed an Enneagram of personality. The myth that this is a 2000 year old Sufi system of um, uh, it's personality types is, I, I don't want to in, insult what the cattle leave behind in a feed pen, but that's about as good uh, uh, an analogy I can come up with. It's just not true. It was invented in the, the, the 19, late 60s, early 70s, AD, 1960s, early 70s, uh, not by Sufis, but by two Chileans. It was taught to a small group at Esalen, and from there it spread. And I was in the first course about the Enneagram, offered in Catholic auspices by one of the people from Esalen. And I thought it was really good at first. I said, wow, this is really great. What I was attracted to was Karen Horney, not Sufi ideas, that, that this was nothing to do with Sufism. But I kept researching more and more about the Enneagram, and I found out that this emperor is buck naked. <laughs> this is this uh, this is just nonsense and we've been sold a bill of goods so i let it slide until i saw it making a revival in catholic auspices at retreat houses i did more research and then started to um argue against it and here is why i made the arguments against it a there's no evidence that there are nine personality types except the spirit Metatron said so. <laughs> and not the Transformer that, yeah, cool. Megatron. <laughs> we have to yeah. distinguish yeah. that. Yeah. And so, I, you know, this hasn't been tested. Secondly, we don't know that these are the types. If there are only nine, we don't know that these are they. That's not been tested, except Ichazo and Naranjo said so. And the idea within the Enneagram that you can develop, you get better by going in one direction and you get worse by following the other direction of these little uh, arrows on the image. How do we know that? Because now you're prescribing for people how they should improve or get worse. How do you know that that's an improvement? The idea Oh, here's another unproven uh, principle that in the Enneagram, everybody has one capital sin at the core of the personality. How do we know that the core of characterological structure is one capital sin? I, I'm not bragging, but I commit more than one capital sin <laughs> on more than one occasion. And sometimes I do them at least in tandem, if not three at a time. So yeah, you had, you had is, said that Catholics go to confession is like almost a form of psychotherapy. I was thinking like, yeah, I have to preface my confessions with like, sorry for ruining your day, Father. You know, yeah. here's, here's my list of capital yeah. sins. Yes, but it's, it, so that's just not provable. That's another problem. And then finally, and this is one of the key things, without evidence, for the truth of the Enneagram, then there are no criteria by which you can judge whether a so-called Enneagram expert is indeed an expert. On what criteria can you say that? You right. have none. And so basically, they hang out their Enneagram expert uh, uh, shingle with a committee vote by me, myself, and I. This is not acceptable. It's a way to get a 
junior uh, psychologist ring with secret nine point decoder of personality <laughs> types and have no training. And you can say, well, spirituality, not psychology, so you don't need a license. I find that unacceptable. Absolutely, Father. I'm right with you there. Um, unfortunately, the, the Mother Angelica control room is telling us that we have to wrap up. Uh, in yes, conclusion, I, I know we, we're just broaching some of these really interesting and timely issues. Um, so if, there, if you could, in conclusion, just tell us, why is this an important topic for today? Um, especially in light of the fact that these ideas are being taught in seminaries. Uh, in, in a lot, it's infiltrated a lot of our religious orders. Why is this timely today? And why is it important to get this message out there? Too many people know the Catholic faith too poorly. And as a result, they don't know how to detect these types of counterfeit spiritualities. And what I want people to do is learn their Catholic faith. Read the catechism. Read the sacred scriptures first and then the catechism. And read the fathers. Know what the Catholic faith teaches so that you can spot these counterfeits. Because the counterfeits will lead you away from the true God as any counterfeit will. And this is uh, why I'm concerned. Counterfeit spirituality serves the enemy of our soul and the kingdom of darkness, not God or his holy kingdom. So that's why I want people to be alert. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Father Mitch Pacwa. And everybody, please do go buy the book, Catholics in the New Age. God bless. Father Mitch. God bless you too. Can I give you a blessing? Absolutely, Lord, please bless do. bless you and keep you the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. Download the Church Militant app today so you can stay up to date on everything going on in the church and the world. Visit the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store today. That's it for this week's Miked Up. Thanks for joining us. To put a bow on it, the New Age movement is diabolical and incompatible with Christian tradition. Servant of God, Father John Harden, once said, at the root of the New Age movement is the denial of an infinite personal God who created the world. As Catholics, those words should draw us closer to Christ and His Church, the only means for us uniting with our infinite God. Pray your rosary every day, live in a state of grace, evangelize, and fight. That's it for this week's Miked Up. God bless you all.